Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining for this Open Ed 2022 session today. My name is Amy Song, and I am your host for today's session entitled English is Also Foreign, Discussion with an ESOL Practitioner. Um, ESOL being English to speakers of other languages, obviously. This tongue-in-cheek title is to signify how overlooked ESOL learners and education is, and why good ESOL education matters, and how we can make use of OER to help accomplish that. To talk about this topic with an, with an appropriate approach, I wanted to bring in an experienced practitioner of OPEN and ESOL to talk about their approach. So I'm joined by Tim Krause, an ESOL instructor from Portland Community College, who has produced over 20 ESOL OERs over the course of his time in OPEN. My goal is to not only provide exposure about ESOL at Open Ed, as it is not a topic that is frequently spoken about, but also about, um, about knowing that the viewers of this presentation are likely already familiar with ESOL and or open pedagogy, I wanted to specifically address the, int the intersection of both in practice. We only have 25 minutes to get today, so I want to get the ball rolling. Uh, so I want to start by more formally introducing ourselves, and then we will jump right into the conversation. So my name is Amy. I am the Customer Success Manager at Pressbooks. I am also an English as a second language learner, so I am an immigrant and at one point I learned how to speak English and I think that if I were to have learned English now, I would love to have access to good and free and accessible educational material. So that is what prompted me to do this presentation for you all today and I'll turn it over to Tim. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everybody. My name is Tim Kraus, and as Amy said, I teach at Portland Community College in Portland, Oregon. I've been teaching there since about 2015, teaching ESOL of all levels and all different kinds of skills. And I also teach online for the Open University of Catalonia in Spain, um, where I focus also for ESOL classes, but with a much more narrow focus on uh, English for business. So it's my pleasure to be here and share a little bit of my experience working with Open Oregon, uh, Open Oregon and Open Educational Resource Materials over the past oh, five, five years or so. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, that is a great introduction and you do some incredible work. So I'm excited to share Thank today. You. So this is our outline for today's discussion. We have four questions and Tim and I will be going through them. And then as you know, with these pre-recorded 25 minute presentation formats at Open Ed, uh, after the recording has ended, uh, I will take some questions from the crowd or, and I'm happy to take them during the chat as well while the conversation is ongoing. So with that said, we can dive right into the topic and we are recording just with their faces now so i'm just going to oh i want to pull up the questions and my first question is what does good esol education look like and what can it do for learners thank you yeah that's a really great question and in my opinion um i have an easy answer i think good esol education is whatever serves the student's needs right mm -hmm. it's whatever the student needs and for example um it can change it can vary a lot so for example most of our beginning students um, especially those who recently uh, moved here are really seeking communication skills that serve everyday life like everyday things like uh, course, things that yeah. we might take for granted like going to the doctor riding the bus going to the grocery store right yeah that's the what's the focus really for uh, a large group of our students but on um, other students are coming to our college um, are seeking more academic study. They're getting ready for ac academic studies after ESOL, either at you know community college or at another university. So their needs are a little bit different. And so, for example, we need to not only um, teach more academic language, but we also need to help them understand what is it like to be a student at a U.S. college. So what are the mm -hmm. expectations? How should they talk to students and classmates and teachers? Um, what kind of vocabulary do they need? What are the experiences they will have after ESOL? So, you know, you might hear the word adulting, like people are learning how to be adulting. Well, we're, yeah. we're teaching <laughs> studenting as well, right? We're teaching studenting about what's it like to be a student in the U.S. And some examples of that might be something like critical thinking, which can vary a lot from culture to culture, uh, writing forms, which change mm -hmm. from culture to culture of what's a good essay, for example, the structure. Um, yeah. Things like that can be really different. So we want to help students understand not only language, vocabulary and grammar, but there's a whole lot right. more to academia. 
But there's one more group. There's a third group of students who come into uh, our classrooms, and they're already highly educated. You know, they know mm -hmm. studenting. They know um, basic. Uh, they know you know they already have a good command of English, for example, and um, they probably already have an advanced degree from their own country. But they come yeah. here and they need to get a degree from here or a license from here or just be able to become more fluent to start working here, and so. Their focus might be more vocational, something like that, right. instead of life skills or academics. So when we talk about, well, what is good ESOL, I think it really needs to be what does a student need? What are the modalities a student works best in? What are the what is the content the student needs? Um, mm -hmm. What is the accessibility the student needs? Um, yeah. You know, for example, what's their level of digital literacy? Stuff like that. Right. So yes, yes. what can we provide? Uh, to be most successful. And sometimes, for example, the commercial textbooks aren't, are not exactly what we need. And through OER, yeah. we, can, we can make what we need. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing answer, especially because you're so experienced in teaching for lots of different kinds of levels. And you're talking about different groups of students who, who are looking to learn English. So I think yeah. that's a really great approach, not only for ESOL, but I'm, I'm currently learning French right now. And I think that's, you know, <laughs> In every language, that's so you know Absolutely. important and probably a very integral part to part to uh, teaching and learning language. Yeah. Um, so, sort of related to that, but sort of shifting gears into the open education side of things, mm -hmm. what do openly licensed materials afford you as an ESOL instructor that you can't do with copyright material? So you were just talking about those textbooks that are not necessarily. Mm -hmm catered to they're not necessarily made with let's say students best interest in mind or that's sort of what you were alluding to so i guess to wrap up that really long question yeah if i could sum it up into two words why oer yeah well that's a good question um because really there's it's twofold and i think a lot of people know the first answer a lot of people know that oer I mean openly education resources uh, are generally free or low cost like the cost of printing at you know at the bookstore or something like that and so that cost savings is a huge factor and it is like the probably the foremost factor you know commercial publishers are um, you know, in it to make money, that's their purpose. OER right. textbook creators are really has education as the focus and not not mm -hmm. making money. Um, and those those textbooks can be really expensive. Um, even in ESOL, where the textbooks aren't as expensive maybe as other disciplines, it right. still can be a cost barrier. And it could be a barrier to uh, enrollment. In fact, some students might need to make a choice. It could be a deal breaker, whether they take a class or take two classes, for example, mm -hmm. because yeah. textbooks can be so expensive. But um, money isn't the only thing. Money is an important part of it, and the cost savings are real. Um, places like Open Oregon, where I work with Open Oregon Educational Resources, they document all the cost savings for, like whenever we get a grant to, to make yeah. something, we, we have to report the enrollment. And, and so they have numbers that prove how successful this is. But on the yeah. other side of things is what we were talking about a little earlier, the content and the, not, I don't want to say control of content, but the ability to curate the content that your students need. It's really important right. and I don't think yeah I think it's maybe underestimated a little bit by people who are new or not familiar with OER um, using OER really allows teachers to deliver the content that students need and so like we're saying mm -hmm. what is good OER it meets the needs of the students well how do I do that if I look at a commercial textbook maybe it's got some of what I need but not but there's a lot that I don't use and so there's a little bit of waste there maybe if you don't use a whole book things like that right yeah and making an OER or using an OER um, allows us to customize the experience for our students. And that might be as simple as just representation. Like what are, right, who are in the photos, right? right? Are yeah. you represented in the <laughs> exactly. photos? Or are yeah. these photos of people that are not represented of the students in the classroom or the local culture? See, the, the OER can also be tailored geographically. Maybe there's something I need or want to share in Oregon that might not be appropriate um, or pertinent to somewhere else in the country or even around the world for that matter, right? Yeah. A culture yeah. in the United states you know would be very different than culture in australia or new zealand or something like that yeah. um and it also allows me as i mentioned to focus on specific skills that i think my students need that may mm -hmm. or may not be in a commercial book um, or a book that you know is existing um 
but beyond that, so that's that's where you're starting with. But also the thing I want to mention too is that OER is so nimble, right? It's very nimble. If you buy a commercial textbook, you might have to wait a year or two for another edition that changes right. something. But with Absolutely. OER, I can make changes right away. Um, yeah. A good example of this is I have a reading book that I have an article about the Olympics that were recently, you know, a, couple, a year or two ago. And it was a really popular article, but it's getting less and less relevant right now. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's easy for me to take out that one story and replace it with something mm. new. And mm -hmm. I have a brand new edition. There is no reprinting of a whole run of thousands of books or something like that. It's really yeah. flexible. And because it's flexible, student, uh, teachers can also, um, what do I want to say, customize or personalize their work um, through downstream editing. So all of my work, for mm -hmm. example, you could take, and it's in Google Docs or Pressbooks or whatever format it's in, you can right. take that format and you can edit it. And not right. only, you know, this is good for fixing typos, for example, yeah. <laughs> but it's also also really good for fixing, uh, not for fixing, for um, uh, updating content or just changing something that you might think, oh, this will work a little better for my students. So I have the ability right. to edit OER and you don't right. have that, edit, that, you don't have that ability with commercial textbooks. So yeah, those absolutely. are the things that I'm thinking about, you know, as, as some of the really strong advantages for OER over commercial textbooks. For sure. And um, I'm going to sort of promote your book here, I suppose, but I know you have a couple of books about Portland in particular yeah. and OER about Portland, which is so interesting because not only is that inspiration to other ESOL practitioners about what what kind of material they could produce, or if they're in the Portland area, they could you know use your book or reuse your book. But this idea of localization that you're mentioning, which is like yeah. a I suppose like a fancy OER term, but also kind of it's, it's a you know uh, it's it's a sensible word. Um, how, how important that is, and to really customize that learning experience. So for example, you know, if you have a grammar book in, in the US, it might be different than an ESL grammar book if you were to teach in, you know, the UK, for example, or in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's that's such a that's such a great point that you bring up. Um, and then I, I this question is related, so you can totally repeat your answer if need be, mm -hmm. but um, what is a crucial or major consideration in an ESOL that is perhaps in an ESOL OER that is perhaps different when you're comparing it to OERs of other disciplines. It took me a while to think about um, this idea when we first um, talked about this question. I don't think, because I don't, on the surface, I don't think there is much difference between OER for ESOL and OER for other disciplines. I mean, some of the major considerations are the same. For example, um, for me, when I'm making a new, uh, starting a new OER project, I think about how will the students get get the material so in that term in that sense i'm thinking about what platform will serve the material best so there's a lot of platforms out there pressbooks is one of them google docs you know google sites all kinds of things that, that you can use and i need to stop and think okay what is the best way to serve the material that i'm making first um, right and, right you know what will support that material because every platform has um strengths that maybe some other platforms don't um mm -hmm. I also like to think more recently about digital and analog. I used to be all like, oh, wow, digital, digital. We're all pushing for, you know, don't print, don't wait, don't save the paper, yeah. <laughs> save the ink. Let's just have it on your phone or have it on your, your, um, your device. And I think that's great in many ways, but especially in ESOL, but I think everywhere, we have yeah. many students coming to college who um, may not, may have some barriers to internet access. And so mm -hmm. it, an analog format or a printed format is sometimes um, very beneficial, especially in ESOL when we have students who might have low digital literacy skills. They're coming to here right. not really knowing a lot about using the computer or using the internet. So thinking about that, that can be, should it be digital or should it be um, uh, print? Should it be both? Ideally both. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I think about is how am I going to meet the accessibility concerns um, in terms mm -hmm. of students with disabilities? Uh, and online that might be, you know, tagging pictures and doing the right formatting so that screen readers can read it. And then offline, it could be the simp also things like contrast and printing and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then other thing that's come up recently is uh, what am I providing in the OER? Like what is this a textbook for students or right. is this a teacher facing book that is just a collection of things that you will print and hand out or display on the screen, mm -hmm. but you don't 
give it to students. It's for the teacher to use in class. Mm -hmm. I've, st I've tried all of these things. Is it an interactive workbook or is it really just a reader? You know, those kinds yeah. of things. What is the format Absolutely. that you need uh, that will serve the material in order to meet the student's needs? Um, and then lastly, one of my lists, I think, which is a global consideration is how, um, how is it best shared with other instructors or other schools? Mm -hmm. Because that's the purpose of OER, right? That we yeah, share yeah, everything. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, and so Absolutely. like, well, how am I gonna get this out there? For me, Open Oregon is behind me. We have, an, we have a database and all that kind of stuff, but there are many repositories, right? Around the, the country yeah. and around the world that you can find, list and find things for uh, OER, for ESOL and for others. So that's, those are some questions that I think are universal. But mm -hmm. um, one thing I think that might be a little more specific to ESOL is that maybe our range of, what do I wanna say this? Mar, um, range of subject matter might be a little wider than some disciplines. Yeah. Like I'm thinking <laughs> yeah, maybe for sure. a book about chemistry is a book about chemistry, but mm -hmm. um, a reading book in ESOL might cover 10 different topics uh, or themes right. or yeah, subject absolutely. areas. Absolutely, yeah. Especially if you're involved in content-based learning where you really absolutely. want like, really want to focus on giving authentic and genuine and interesting content that absolutely. is relevant and useful, right? That's not stale, you know, or has yeah. you know has been reused a million times. So, and, exactly. Um, and I, I think something that I, I really appreciated about your books, and the reason I wanted to talk to you specifically, is because you you know you have um, books about you know Portland, but you also have like a uh, like a learner friendly version of a Christmas Carol. So yeah. there's you know so many different there's different varieties, and I think that with the beauty of open being that it's you know shareable and reusable mm -hmm. oftentimes um there's such a breadth of material that you can take from and take inspiration from and i think that uh that, that's that's super important i'll give you a couple of examples too of the breadth there of is beyond like a christmas carol in portland like you said i also have um a curriculum based on shark tank the TV show, which is oh also, also around the world, right? Uh, yeah, so in many absolutely. different languages. Yeah, and then I, yeah. I'm working on a reader right now of short stories from uh, what we call the outer circle of world Englishes. So world English is places where English is, is one of the uh, standard languages in the country. Um, and things, stories that people there are writing in English, not just from the United States or yeah. UK or something like that. So it's really, you know, all over the map, literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah, literally, that's so funny. Um, so that might yeah, be a that might be what's different, I think, in ESOL, and maybe it's not really so much a challenge. I think it's an advantage, actually, that we can draw on so many different things to, sure. again to come back to meet the needs of our students. What is relevant? Yeah. What is culturally relevant? What is linguistically yeah. relevant? What do they need? Absolutely, and I think that uh, you know, globally, there's um, a lack of attention on ESOL learners, especially because English is almost expected oftentimes so i think to take the time to really localize and to think about who's who is going to be reading this material yeah. uh is, is is super super crucial when we think about it from like um like a justice standpoint as well i remember mm -hmm. we were talking about that prior to this call so and and from a practical standpoint i mean because when you mentioned that um teaching english as a foreign language for example taking teaching english in japan is really different than teaching english to as a second language or to speakers right. of other languages here um, the, the, the motivation is different, the, the goals are different, the strategies are a little different. And so again, OER can meet those different needs, whereas a commercial publisher may not be able to have two different versions of one book. You would... Absolutely. That's a very, that's a very fair point as well. Um, and, and a very good point to, to add. Uh, we only have about five minutes, so mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you my last question before I showcase some of your beautiful work. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask my last question being, how can others advance the OER work in ESOL, and what does this community need? Sure, sure. Get involved, right? That's what I, I would say yeah. is the best thing. <laughs> uh, get involved and think of it this way. Um, we need more materials so that we have more diversity of things to choose from because every teacher teaches a little differently. And, you yeah. know, I may think Shark Tank was a great idea. You may think, oh, <laughs> I want something completely different. So we need choices. Yeah. We need choices. So get involved. But I also want to clarify one thing about that is when I talk to teachers who are just getting into OER, just hearing about it, they're often really intimidated by this. Oh, I have to make I have to write a book. I have to like yeah. create all this stuff from scratch. Yeah. And really the truth is there, 
you don't have to. That's what OER is about, is that you can, there's a lot of good material out there that you can choose from and just use it as is. Adopt it like a book or take it and personalize it a little bit or however yeah. much you want. You don't have to start from scratch. But if you do, is you know, you, or if you want to, it, you certainly can. Yeah, but yeah. I just want to make sure people know there are different ways to sort of dip your toe in the OER world. Yeah, that's that's a that's an awesome recommendation. I think it's a really uh, I think I think it's really the fact that we are open ed and we're talking about, you know, remixing, especially in a discipline mm -hmm. that's often overlooked, I think is super important. And um, I think something that all I think ultimately that ESOL learners can really benefit from. So thank yeah. you so much for all of your <laughs> answers. You're <laughs> welcome. They were so my wonderful. And I'm so happy that, uh, that that we got to have this conversation today. Yeah, it's my so, pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so going back to our presentation here, um, hopefully you can see my slides. Uh, this is our resource page. These are all linked. So this will take you to Tim's ESOL OERs. I've already switched screens a bunch of times, so I won't switch again <laughs> for the sake of our viewers. But there are over 20 resources on here, um, all on different platforms and uh, available in different modalities, which I think is really wonderful. So please, 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 if you're interested, go and check them out, I'm sure. Um, many of them, if not all of them, are openly licensed. So you are welcome to read them and adapt them to your liking. There's also a couple of other places where you'll be able to find Tim's, Tim's books. Um, the Open Organ Repository is uh, where um, a lot of Tim's books were produced. And uh, a couple of selections of his books down here that I think were, I, I chose some that had a high interactivity. So lots of H5P activities that mm -hmm. you can draw from, as well as some with very pretty covers that uh, touched on different <laughs> <laughs> language levels as well. So I thought they were great. Did you have anything to add about your books, Tim? Only to please explore OER, explore my works, explore everybody's works, try it. And um, I think that you will be pleasantly surprised um, by the success you'll have. Um, thank you so much again, and if you do have any questions about the presentation, this is a little bit about me, uh, and thank you very much to everyone once again for joining us for this Open Ed session, and I hope you have a lovely rest of Open Ed 2022, and thank you again, Tim. Goodbye. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>